Okay. Now, our task today, we were going to have a message called Come Out of Her, My People, based on Revelation 18, 4. And then we were going to have a message on the millennium, but it would just be fire hydrant. You know, I mean, you wouldn't have a lot of time for questions. So what we're going to do, we're skipping Come Out of Her, My People. My wife wasn't happy this morning when she heard that. But anyway, so we're skipping that one, and we're doing a, a, a message on the millennial issue in Revelation 20. And then what we'll do is have... The last session, not me, mainly speaking, but you asking questions, and I think there's some cards for you to be filling out, and we can look at those questions. So uh, our time today, then, is the millennial issue in Revelation chapter um, 20, and uh, I, I could do a lot of things here. Um, <clears throat> I have to skip over because of time. This is about the symbolic nature of the apocalypse. We've already talked about that. And um, so, you know, we could talk about how people approach the whole book. The people that think it's literal and not symbolic see that every vision, one after another, is a, a, it's a chronological sequence. So the order of the visions represents the order of future history, and that is uh, uh, often in the past, and still sometimes, is the way the literal futurists read the whole book of Revelation. So just, uh, uh, it's, a, it's a chronological progression, and it's all about the future. It all, the visions really begin after the church has been raptured, <clears throat> and it's during that seven-year tribulation. So this is a, an example of the futurist view I'm doing this because your pastor told me to include it. I wasn't going to include it, but I'm going to do so. Um, I, I obey. Uh, okay. So there are different ways to picture this uh, futurist view. This is a typical one. You have the seven, the seven seals here. And then the seven trumpets are seen as filling up the, the seventh uh, seal. And then the bowls, the seven bowls are seen as filling up the seventh trumpet. So you can see how, how, nevertheless, there's a chronological march here. Okay, and that's uh, that's a typical view of uh, uh, the futuristic uh, chronological view of the book. Now, um, this is a view by William Hendrickson in his book *More Than Conquerors*. And if you don't have *More Than Conquerors*, I encourage you to get it. I, my wife and I, uh, read that book together after dinner in the evenings. <clears throat> Um, and it's, it's a commentary on Revelation, but it's a devotional commentary on Revelation. It's, it's both uh, a substantive cognitively and substantive spiritually. So this is his outline of the book, and he sees seven sections uh, of the book. He sees uh, chapters 1 to 3 here, and uh, is the first, second, 4 to 7, the next, 8 through 11, that is uh, the seals, um, uh, sorry, the trumpets, here are the seals, uh, and then here you have actually seven uh, uh, visions. Uh, it's divided up into seven visions in this section, 12 to 14, and, and, but all of these, all of these overlap. It's called synchronous parallelism. They're all uh, about the same time period, but it's looking at the same time period from different vantage points. Uh, it's, it's as if, you know, you're, you're in this room and you want to really examine, you know, the wall over here. Well, that might be the seals. And then you want to you look over here. Well, that wall is still there, but now we're, we're, we're focusing on another part of the same room at the same time. And so on. And so uh, they recapitulate. They don't go one after another in history. In other words, the order of the visions is not the order uh, of history. Okay. And this is typical in Old Testament. Typical, as we're going to see in a moment. The Old Testament prophets, I mean, you read Isaiah. You read Jeremiah. I had a, a friend who wrote a, a commentary on Ezekiel. And he said, I had to get a thesaurus uh, to, to, to finally use different words for Israel going into exile and coming back in restoration. I mean, Ezekiel is just about going into captivity because of your sin, and, but you'll come back. Go into captivity because and you'll come in. And these chapters just recapitulate again and again and again. They, they're, they're focusing on different aspects. And so it is in the book of Daniel. Daniel has five visions, 
all about the future, but they recapitulate one another. They overlap temporally about that future, and so on. So uh, this is one example. He sees all seven of these sections of Revelation as synchronously parallel. Now, another view by Meredith Klein, who's an Old Testament scholar, but he did some work on the book of Revelation. He agrees with Hendrickson, but he sees the middle visions. He, he defines the, the parameters of each section a little differently. He sees five synchronous visions, like Hendrickson. But the first one, chapters 1 to 3, is the church imperfect, and the last, uh, 21.9 to 22.5, is the church perfect. So that the, those are kind of the bookends. And uh, I, I, I adopt that view myself. Um, one reason uh, that I like it is because Daniel... Uh, Revelation so saturated with the book of Daniel, and Daniel has five synchronous visions, and this would uh, perhaps be modeled on Daniel as having five synchronous visions. And then um, you notice the trumpets and bowls. Another reason I take these uh, these sections as synchronous is talking about the same time period but from different angles, is because of the trumpets and bowls. They are both uh, modeled on the book of Exodus. If you look through, each of, each of these uh, uh, trumpets are based on, on different, most of them at any rate, are based on different uh, uh, plagues from the Exodus. And so the bowls as well, uh, for the most part. And, and commentators uh, recognize that. But I think it's another indication that here in the, the bowls, we're looking at uh, the plagues of the trumpets from a different perspective. We're looking from, at, at the... Uh, uh, latter-day Exodus plagues from a different perspective. That's what's going on. We're, we're not talking about the actual Exodus plagues. We're talking about how those plagues will come again. Something like them will come again. Um, so uh, that's, uh, but, and, uh, that's another reason I see parallelism here. And um, let's see. Yeah, this is a good example of Klein's view where you see... Uh, the church imperfect, false prophets. Now we got the 12 true apostles. False Jews, names of the tribes of true Israel. Christians dwell where Satan's throne is. Christians dwell where God's throne is. So all of these are the imperfections that are perfectly in an antithetical way met in the new heavens and the new earth. Um, yeah, and here, uh, what, what the letters promise, uh, whether it's food, temple, eternal security, incorruptible clothing, what they promise the uh, new heavens and earth gives. So, um, now, this is a beautiful example of recapitulation in one prophet, the prophet Ezekiel. Uh, all of these visions, all of these, uh, a lot of them are visions, but all of them, uh, right, all the way to 26 and 27, uh, they really recapitulate. They're talking about Israel's sin, lack of repentance, and going into exile, and sometimes restoration. But they're looking at the same general time period, and then toward the end of Ezekiel, you get a, a final, beginning in 39 to 47, that's now talking about the final end right there. That is different. And so it's a beautiful example of how prophets overlap. In fact, uh, if you notice here, you see that? Revelation, in many ways, is modeled on the book of Ezekiel. In fact, that first vision in chapters 4 to 5, the first major vision, uh, is to a great extent modeled on Ezekiel. That's why you have the, these, these, these cherubim, these uh, angelic figures that they come from Ezekiel and so on. So, um, so I, I'm not going to do any more on on this. But basically, that's the view I take. It's called synchronous parallelism uh, or synchronous recapitulation. Um, I don't know if anybody has any questions because now we're going to get into Revelation 20. Uh, that's a very crass summary that I didn't plan on giving, but I thought, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll try to give a little summary of that. Um, any, any, any questions on, on, on that? I'm perfectly understood. It's amazing. Uh, <laughs>
Yes. Yeah. <coughs> Hendrickson is one, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. More than Conquerors. Yeah, I would really recommend that book. You'll love that book. I, uh, you know, if you're married, read it with your mate. It's, it's a, you know, we just read maybe a couple of pages a night. And uh, we've continued to do that throughout our marriage. It's been great. That's when we have our time. But, uh, we, we study the Bible in the mornings by ourselves. We leave each other alone. So, yeah. Yeah, it um, it stops right here with uh, chapter thirty nine. From there on, it's all future. Yeah. Okay. Now the millennium. Uh, this is uh, you know, gosh, I mean. Evangelicals argue over this more than anything else. And up until very recently, in fact, it continues. It's premillennials, especially in the shadow of Dallas Seminary, premillennialism is alive and well. <clears throat> some tell me that uh, in some uh, sectors of, of the Metroplex, postmillennialism is alive and well. And in other sectors, amillennialism is alive and well. So it sounds like we have good diversity in the Metroplex. Um, so, um, uh, I, I can't adequately cover everything. What I'm going to begin with is showing why I hold to amillennialism, and I'll make some contrasts with premillennialism, why I don't hold that, and then toward the end we'll move to postmillennialism. Okay? So, um, first of all, this is the thesis of... of uh, chapter 21 to 15, the millennium is inaugurated during the church age as God limits Satan's deceptive powers and as deceased Christians are vindicated by spiritually reigning in heaven. The millennium is concluded by a resurgence of Satan's deceptive assault against the church and the final judgment. That's in verses 7 through 10. And by the way, that's the problem with postmillennialism. Postmillennialism sees things as getting better, the world being Christianized. This ends with Satan leading uh, hordes against uh, the covenant community. That, that clashes with a postmillennial view. So already I've begun to interact. Uh, it, it will become evident that, that I do hold amillennialism. I don't like that word amillennialism because ah means uh, it's a negative. It's a, it's a uh, Primitive and uh, it means no millennium. And uh, what they mean by that is there's no physical millennium. It's a spiritual millennium. But I don't like that. I believe there's really a millennium. It's a spiritual millennium. So I call myself an already and not yet millennialist. An already and not yet millennialist. I'm also an ironic post-millennialist. I see things getting better and better from the time of uh, Christ's resurrection until his final coming. They're going to get better and better and better. I just don't believe you'll be able to see it spiritually. Things, people will come into the church of God. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church until the very end. But I don't see it as a physical transformation. I see it as, uh, as uh, more and more believers added to the church. And uh, another difference I have with postmillennialism is I see it as a remnant who's added to the church in every generation, not the majority of the world at any point. It's a remnant, and that's what we saw really in chapter 11. It's the remnant church that is the witnessing church. It's only two churches in Revelation uh, 2 to 3 that are really faithful and without blame. And so, <clears throat> so I, I, I don't think remnant theology ever stops. Uh, there are some who believe it does stop, uh, that the majority of Israel will be saved at the end of time. Postmillennialists have believed that. And premillennialists have believed that. And by the way, there's an overlap between postmillennialists and premillennialists in their interpretative approach. And that is, they take things literally. They, they take a lot literally. Both of them. Whereas I would take them spiritually because of the way John uses the words. Temple is a good example. 
I don't think it's architectural. The way John uses temple of God and Paul and elsewhere, it's speaking of God's spiritual presence with his people. So <clears throat> those are some introductory comments. Um, now, it, it, we're going to have question and answer time, but, you know, if you have a pressing question in the midst of this, please, please ask me because it's likely that someone else uh, would have the same question. Now, um, let's see. So let's, uh, I think it would be nice to read the text. So um, let's read what we're talking about. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key of the abyss and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of the dragon, the serpent of old, who was the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he threw him into the abyss and shut it and sealed it over him so that he would not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were completed. After these things, he must be released for a short time. Then I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or his image and had not received the mark on their forehead and on their hand, and they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were completed. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power. But they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. Okay, then, then uh, the passage um, continues. I don't have it on the overhead, but it continues. And uh, I, I want to read that. If you have your Bibles, look with me at Revelation 20, how verse 7 continues. And when the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together for the war, the number of them is like the sand of the seashore. And they came up on the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. This is the opposite of a post-millennial progression. The, the majority of the world is surrounding the covenant community here. Um, and it goes on, uh, and fires came down from heaven and devoured them. So, so the covenant community is saved at the very end. Now, um, my main, uh, one of the main reasons that I'm an inaugurated millennialist, the millennium starts with the resurrection and ends uh, really when uh, the devil's released, technically speaking, from prison and gathers the whores. That's when the millennium actually ends because it says after the thousand years, right? In verse 7. When the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released. So there's a little bitty period of time there, you see, after the millennium and before the very end. So um, the premillennialist has a wonderful point. Uh, well, let me put it this way. It has a substantive point, a significant point, because they say, if we go back, if you look at verse uh, 3, it says, they threw the uh, devil into the abyss, shut it, sealed it over him so that he would not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were completed. And so uh, I, I have friends who, who, who are premillennialists or scholars, and we talk about this. I say, you can't get around this. Uh, this is, um, you, if this is the millennium, Beal, that you're saying, why is the devil so active? Doesn't seem like he's uh, restricted very much to me. There's got to be a time when the devil's totally restricted. And that's the millennium, and it hasn't come. Okay? So, uh, what, what would I say about that? Um, <clears throat> well, context is the king, it is the queen, it is the governor, and it's the prime minister. That's another rule of interpretation. So what we want to do is we want to see what does the context say about the devil's imprisonment? What precisely is the devil being confined with respect to? And so, again, read with me verse 6. Because verse 3 just says he confined, okay? Verse 6, or verse 7. 
And when the thousand years are completed, Satan will be released from his prison. Okay, So he'll become unconfined. And with regard to what? What will he become unconfined with respect to? It's verse 8. He'll come out and deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together for the war. The number of them is like the sand of the seashore. And they came up on the broad plain of the earth, surrounded the camp of the saints, and almost annihilated it. So was the devil confined in every single way? The context in verses 7 and following say that the confinement of the devil was mainly with respect to not being able to mount an attack, to gather the nations together and mount an attack and annihilate the church. In other words, as, as it said in the gospel, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Uh, that's the point. But there will come a time when the gates of hell will prevail almost, and then fire will come down. So the devil, I don't think, is confined in every way in verse 3. He's confined in the sense that he cannot mount an attack, deceive and gather together all the nations to come against the covenant community and annihilate it. That is, the, he, the gates of hell. Satan's gates will not be able to prevail against the church. And I think it's somewhat similar. So we're saying that the devil's not confined in every way, but with respect to that major way. And, and we have something very similar in the gospel. Some people do make this comparison in uh, Mark chapter 3 and in verses 22 to 27. Uh, we have a parallel or a parable by Jesus. And he says in Mark chapter 3, beginning at verse 22, to give the context, the scribes who came down from Jerusalem were saying, He is possessed by Beelzebul, and he cast out the demons by the ruler of the demons. And he called them to himself and began speaking to them in parables. And Jesus says, How can Satan cast out Satan? And if a kingdom is divided against that itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. If Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he can't stand. Then he gives this further parable, parable, parable. But no one can enter the strong man's house and plunder his property unless he first binds the strong man and then he will plunder his house. Jesus there is talking about Satan and how he has bound Satan as the strong man. And Satan's still plenty alive and well. He's, after this, there are other, you know, he inspires demons and this sort of thing, and he puts Jesus to the cross. Or they're, he's still alive. But I think that it was at the temptation. That was Jesus' decisive victory over the devil that could not be reversed. From that point on, uh, that was the victory. And from that point on, it was just a matter of uh, the devil uh, finding his ultimate uh, demise at not just the resurrection, but then at the very end of the age. Here in our passage is the final demise, because he then goes into the lake of fire. So um, this is the binding of the strong man is not a binding in every way. In the context, uh, Jesus is saying, I have restrained the power of the devil. Uh, yeah, he, he can still exercise uh, his power, but uh, he's, he's basically defeated. So um, I think that's a, that's a good parallel. And so um, that, that's a, that is the major argument of the premillennialist. Um, and that's my major response. I, any questions? I'm happy to take, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it would be Luke 10. Yeah, it would be the same thing. Mm -hmm. and I think that refers to uh, uh, the temptation, but I think it refers to his continuing victory over the devil, not just one event, but I think that's a major event to be included. Thank you. Yeah, very good. Any other questions? Okay, so... Um, Another major argument by the premillennialist is found in chapter uh, 20 and verse 1, uh, where you can see here that <clears throat> says, I saw an angel, the then, 
In Greek, that word is an. An, I saw an angel. And the question is this. Does the an, should it be translated then? By the way, that's, I believe, New American Standard. Let me see. No, no, it must not be New American. My New American says, and I saw an angel. I don't know which translation has then. How many of you have then in Revelation chapter 20? What? ESV, okay. Then. Um, that really is an interpretation, isn't it? Because what that's saying is, this is temporally after chapter 19. And what's chapter 19? We're going to talk about it. That's the final battle between Christ and the nations. He defeats them. So if this is then, then the millennial passage comes after that defeat. And there's this bliss. And then at the end of the millennium, you got another battle. This time the devil rouses people up. And there's another battle and another defeat. So um, basically you have two judgments, really. Um, so uh, the question is, if you really look at the word and, get your concordance out. <laughs> you can do that. Um, what? No, no, no. No. No, just in chapter 19. Just in chapter 19. <laughs> So you gotta you gotta figure out you know how do you limit this stuff or you go crazy, okay? So um, the the ands there are thirty five uh, ands in chapter nineteen eleven to nineteen. That's the final battle, okay? There are uh, thirty five ands there. Only three indicate a chronological sequence of one thing coming after another. However, what's very difficult is, once you get to chapter 20, the ands do indicate chronological sequence uh, after verse 1. So he has an abyss, and he laid hold of Satan, the dragon, and he bound him. Let's go through it. And he threw him into the abyss. Went back. No, that's 24. Then. Is that then? Is that right? I think that's. And. Yeah. Whew. VSB. <laughs> I'm going to talk to Vern Poitras. He's a colleague of mine from Westminster. He's on the ESV. He's an amillennialist and he's translating then. <laughs> so we got it. It's and. So, but. Actually, here's the question. Is this after the binding of Satan or at the same time of the binding of Satan? I think this is synchronous with the binding of Satan. As he's bound, they're being given their dominion. It could be uh, uh, chronologically after, but, but we could argue that. And... Um, uh, and we're mainly looking at, at the ends connecting uh, the major verses and sections here. The rest of the dead did not die, blessed and holy. You may not have any more ends. Okay. That's, uh, okay. So, really, it's pretty hard here to determine um, whether this. And should be translated as then, so that this is after the final battle, and the millennium is after the final battle. Uh, or, remember, we, we have a lot of recapitulation in the book, remember? And actually, we're going to see it here. Uh, is this going back before the battle? Is this uh, a section that now is going back before the battle of chapter 19? It's really hard to know, because the ends in chapter... Uh, 19 are, are not chronological. They do begin to be chronological after verse 1. So it's very hard. What I would say is this. I don't think we should do anybody should have a dogmatic view that uh, how you understand this passage is based on and. Okay? It, it, it's too difficult to know at this point whether it means then or 
uh, it's recapitulating. Okay, so um, <clears throat> let's look through here. Uh, when are we supposed to stop? I'm trying to I suppose according to this 245. Wow. Okay. Um, all right. I'm going to have to really abbreviate. Well, yeah. This is about, uh, you can tell, remember uh, an angel descends? Remember in, in verse 1, I saw an angel coming down from heaven? And elsewhere in the book, let's use a concordance, when an angel either descends or ascends at the beginning of a vision, that vision is either stopping the chronological sequence or it's going back before the preceding section. And so, uh, now we only have three instances in chapter 7 and verse uh, 2, chapter 18, verse 1, and chapter 10 and verse 1. So is that enough to really become a pattern? Um, I, 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 I think it's tantalizing, and I think it kind of points a little bit toward this angel as he's descending. This is indicating that this passage is either stopping the chronological sequence or probably going back before that final battle in chapter 19. Um, I'm not going to do that. Ah, yeah, let's look at this. Remember, chapter 20 and verse 4 said, And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given to them. Now, the premillennialist, uh, and I believe the postmillennialist, if I'm not mistaken, sees that as actually uh, saints reigning upon the earth. Of course, all of this is symbolism, because um, we've been told the, to expect symbolism. And anyway, when you look at the words in verse 1, chain, dragon, serpent, uh, verse 3, an abyss, um, th those are pretty symbolic words. I don't think you can take those in a direct one-to-one -one way with physical reality. And so... Thrown here occurs 46 times in the book. And uh, it always refers uh, to God's throne or the saints' heavenly thrones. Now there's one place where it refers to Satan's throne of authority. But uh, uh, 42 uh, times outside of Revelation 24, it refers to God's throne or the saints' throne. Heavenly thrones. It does not refer to a throne on earth. It does not refer to earthly thrones. I think that's important. Um, I think that goes against the idea that we're talking about a physical reign on thrones on the earth. Whether the postmillennial might take that view or the premillennialist definitely does. Um, so I'll take you through all the uses of throne. Okay, and then we have this parallel with Revelation 6, 9 through 11. And there, um, notice the parallels. Uh, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the testimony which they had maintained. And, and they're clearly exalted in heaven. They're, they're given a white robe to vindicate that the verdict upon them by the world has been overturned. That's part of the point of the white robe. And... Um, in Revelation 20, verse 4, likewise, I saw souls, again, uh, of those who had been beheaded here, those who were slain, because of their testimony to Jesus, because of the testimony which they had maintained. Um, and my contention is that these people are reigning in heaven, as we'll see. Um, and, I, and I think this is a parallel passage showing that, uh, indeed, uh, They've been exalted to heaven. These people are exalted to heaven. So when we see these people have been raised to reign on thrones, at their death, saints go to an escalated reign. They're already priests and kings on, on earth spiritually, but they go to an escalated reign uh, until the final age when they have full resurrection bodies because you, re you realize that when saints die and they go to be with the Lord, they're not perfected. They're ethically perfected, but not physically. So it's still an imperfect state, very interesting, uh, even though they are in God's presence. Um, yeah, um, 
you know, the, the premillennialist sees two resurrections in our passage. Um, in uh, chapter 4, um, and, and we'll go, well, I'm not going to go back to it. I'm just going to look at my Bible here. You can look at yours. In chapter 4 at the end, it says that these people who had died, they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So those are the martyrs in the millennium for the premillennials who come to life and reign with Christ in the millennium. But then, verse 5, the rest of the dead not come to life until the thousand years were completed. There's a second resurrection. Both these are physical resurrections. Uh, the Bible knows nowhere else of two resurrections, two physical resurrections uh, that are eschatological. Now, does that make it wrong? No, that maybe this is a new revelation for us. But um, I, I think we need to let Scripture interpret Scripture here. We have no other place where there are two resurrections. Nor are there two judgments. There's a judgment at the end of chapter 19, and again, the judgment of the armies at uh, the end of chapter 20. It's, uh, you begin to multiply things a bit too much, in, in, in my view. Um, so, um, here's a very interesting one. Um, let's see. Yes. It is. I think that's talking about the very end of time. Yeah. Yeah, parallel mode. Exactly. Beautiful. Thank you for that question. Excellent. Okay. Um, because remember, right after that is the judgment. And I think it's the beginning of the final judgment. Thank you. Um, okay, now I'm going to talk about something that's very difficult. I'm not going to read it off the computer. It's so hard. Well, no, this one's not hard. Okay. This is probably one, but besides the abyss argument by the premillennialist, this is the second one that's probably the best argument for the premillennialist. And it is uh, that verses, verse 4 talks about a coming to life, and verse 5 talks about a coming to life. And uh, the premillennialist says that has to, they have, both have to be physical resurrections. They're too close together. If in one verse it's speaking of a spiritual resurrection and the next it's a physical resurrection, then let's just do away with language. Okay? Because I would argue that in verse 4 when it says, and they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years, that's a spiritual resurrection into heaven, not physical. I say, oh, Beal, you're arguing for spiritual resurrection in verse 4, and then the very next verse when it says they did not come to life, then that, that's a physical resurrection? You're doing away with all meaning of words, and that's actually what some commentators say like Alfred uh, in his commentary on Revelation, he says, if in a passage where two resurrections are mentioned, if the first resurrection may be understood to mean spiritual rising with Christ, while the second means literal rising from the grave, then there's an end to all significance of language, and scripture's wiped out as a definite testimony to anything, and don't listen to Beale. <laughs> okay? In another commentary that's uh, written a, a generation later by Robert Mounts, he says the same thing. So that's a good argument. In fact, if you look at the Greek word um, resurrection, in Greek pronounced anastasis, almost all of the time it does refer to a physical resurrection. So that's a good argument. They're trying to interpret, they're using the concordance now on me, and, uh, and they're coming back at me here in a polite, nice, humble way. And so, um, so let's look and see... Uh, uh, what I do with that, and, and first of all, I want to just move ahead a little bit, and um, yeah, I want to show you how elsewhere in the New Testament you can have a physical resurrection discussed in the immediate context with a spiritual resurrection. So John 5. John 5, the one believing who sent me has eternal life. Okay? That's resurrection. And does not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. By the way, Eternal life is an, is an allusion to Daniel 12, too, where it says people will rise and have eternal life. So uh, that's definitely resurrection life. And, uh, and then they will live. These are all words from a Greek word called zao. Uh, and so just the father has life, so the son has life. And then at the end of the passage, it says, uh, uh, talking about the final physical resurrection, they will come forth. Those having done good deeds 
to a resurrection of life, those having practiced evil deeds, to a resurrection of judgment. And there's that word, anastasis, that the premillennialist says is always spiritual. But you'll notice here that this resurrection is the actual quotation from Daniel 12, 2, and it's begun to happen. An hour comes, and now is. Now is. When the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. In other words, the, the Daniel 12, 2 resurrection is inaugurated right here. It now is. Right here. Where is now? There it is. And now is. And then it will happen constantly. It happens spiritually and consummately. Here it's called uh, a life. Here it's called resurrection. Notice, of life. And so that's pretty close parallelism where you can have resurrection and life just meaning the same things in the immediate same context. Uh, and we have this also in Romans. This is Christ was raised from the dead. Walk in, you walk in newness of life. Uh, and then he says, we will be in the likeness of his resurrection. Anastaseo, so that's, that's the word for resurrection. We'll be in the likeness of his resurrection. For if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will live with him. Living is the same as resurrection here. But the life Christ lives, he lives to God. This is resurrection life, by the way. Christ is resurrection. So also you reckon yourselves to be dead to God, but living to God in Christ Jesus. Present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead. So the so zao, come to life, is used synonymously with resurrection here in the same, the very same context. So I, I, I really don't have a problem with that. But furthermore, what's very interesting about that passage in Revelation 20 um, is this. What you have here, you have souls of those who had been beheaded. Okay, that's a first death. Then you have over those experiencing uh, uh, the first resurrection, the second death has no power. There's a second death. Okay, doesn't sound too profound yet. But here. There's a first death, even though it's not called first death, clearly a first death, right here. And a second death. The first death is opposite to and different in kind from the second death. Because the first is physical. The second is spiritual. This is a spiritual death. Even though it's in a resurrection body, people will be in resurrection bodies, it, it's, it's a, a, an eternal separation death from God. Uh, and so, um, so now if there are two deaths that are opposite to and different in kind from one another, uh, this is a spiritual eternal death that consumes the body, really. This is physical. So here, the saints came to life. I think that's spiritual life. And then uh, the rest of the dead did not come to physical life until the thousand years were completed. So you've got uh, a resurrection that's spiritual and a resurrection of the dead, the final unbelieving dead at the end of time that is physical. So again, the saints, when they come to life in verse 4, it's a spiritual resurrection, which is opposite to and different in kind from the final uh, resurrection body of the saints. And so uh, I, I, I think that uh, what we have here is um, this, this idea of opposites. For example, when it, Hebrews talks about the first covenant, the old covenant and the new covenant. The Old Covenant is different to and opposite in kind to the New Covenant. They're different in quality. One has uh, Jesus Christ has accomplished the New Covenant. The Old Covenant failed because of the priests that could die and the sacrifices that weren't eternal and so on. Um, or we talk about the first Adam and the last Adam. Uh, the first Adam is different to uh, in kind and opposite to the last Adam. He, first Adam disobeyed, he died. Last Adam obeyed, lives forever. Um, and... In chapter uh, 21, we have the statement in verse 4 that Christ will wipe away every tear from their eyes and there will no longer be any death and no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. So no longer any physical death, it says. That's a physical death. That's verse 4. 
Then, verse 8 says that the cowardly, the unbelieving, godless people, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So very clearly here we have a first death and a second death here. And uh, I think that that supports the idea that we have a first resurrection that's spiritual and a second resurrection that's physical. In fact, chapter 21 and verse 1, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away. So the, the first heaven and earth was different in kind and opposite to the new heavens and earth, which would last forever and would not pass away. And so I think it makes sense that you can have uh, a, a spiritual resurrection with a physical resurrection here opposite to it, and, and that's, that's, that's why you have it. And I think what John is doing here, or Revelation, is showing the irony of death, that when people die, um, they, uh, what happens to them? Um, well, the second death has no power over them. I think I have a, a chart on that. Let's see. Yeah, when a believer dies, that just exalts them into a, a further resurrection. The second physical res res resurrection of the wicked just propels them into a second spiritual death that lasts forever. So um, that, that, that's my response. It's actually a view that Meredith Klein espoused. I, I think the view is, is on the right track. I'm not sure I should even ask questions about uh, uh, what I've just explained because that's a little, a little complicated. But um, any questions on that one? <laughs> that's a tough one. Okay. Um, I've already talked about the symbols. I think Revelation is symbolic. I think the number 1,000 is not literal. probably stands for the complete perfection of uh, the millennial age. Now... This is something very important. Let's see what time do we have here? Okay. You think? Okay. Uh, here we have a beautiful example of recapitulation. We have in chapter 19, 28, and 16, 14 that um, the kings of the earth gathered together to make war. Notice that phrase. Uh, and in 28, the nations of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together for the war. 16, the kings of the whole inhabited earth gather together for the war. That is parallel terminology. And it comes from Zechariah 14.2 and 12. In Zechariah 14.2, it's predicting this final war. It says, I will gather the nations together for war. The word is uh, episunaxo, and, uh, and then the phrase for war. So there's this prophecy in Zechariah. God will gather together for war. And in verse um, 12, yeah. um, these are all parallel. We're talking about the... It's the same prophecy from Zechariah chapter 14. It's the same prophecy. There's going to be God will gather nations together for war. And you find that three times. It's not talking about three different fulfillments of the prophecy. It's talking about the one fulfillment. And it's rep he, he, he mentions it three different times to emphasize it. These aren't three different fulfillments. This is one fulfillment that three different passages give. This is an example of recapitulation and so, where it says in chapter 19, remember that's the final war? And we're wondering, oh, is chapter 20 after the final war? No. Chapter 20 and verse 8 says after the millennium, there's the war. That means the millennium is before this war and before that war. I'm excited, but I'm not sure people are following me. <laughs> <coughs> Any questions about
Yeah, chapter 38 is about a final battle in Ezekiel. And guess what? I think this is what you're saying. Chapter 39 repeats it. It recapitulates the battle of Ezekiel 38. So you've got recapitulation right there in Ezekiel 38. 39 goes over the same territory again. And so that's another reason to see that this battle here is being recapitulated here. And actually recapitulated for chapter 16. Are you following that? So if, uh, if the prophecy of Zechariah is fulfilled here in chapter 19, and it's mentioned again at the end of the millennium, when the nations come, then this must be recapitulated. It's got to be the same battle. Now there's some people who say, no, this is a, here's the first stage of the battle, the second stage of the battle, and the third stage of the battle. It, it all gets too complicated for me. I'm a simple person. And uh, I, it's possible. All things are is it probable? We don't have three fulfillments anywhere in the New Testament. So, um, I, I think it's likely it's recapitulation, especially since I think there are examples of recapitulation throughout uh, the book of Revelation, as I've already argued. Let's go to another one. This is very similar. Notice here. Here in chapter 19, in describing the destruction of the enemy who comes against Christ, Ezekiel 39 is mentioned, come, assemble the, for the great supper of God. And then Ezekiel 39, 18 to 20, uh, which is um, gathered together to make the war against him who sat upon the horse and against his army. So you, you have these armies on horsemen, Ezekiel 39, 18 through 20. And so then when you come to the battle at the end of the millennium, you again have references to the Ezekiel battle. They're a little different, but you still have the war there as here. Uh, but you have these references to the final Ezekiel battle. Again, it just shows Ezekiel 39 recapitulates 38, and so Revelation 20 recapitulates chapter 19. Beautiful. But it, they're just uh, modeling after the prophets. That's what the prophets did, recapitulated. So what, that, what does that mean? It means that the millennium precedes this battle. Okay, because uh, premillennialists want to say the millennium comes after this battle, but there's a problem. Because at the end of the millennium, you have the battle again. It's just more likely that this is recapitulating this, and so that the millennium that comes before this final battle in chapter 20 precedes the final battle of chapter 19 as well. Oh, this is beautiful. Notice <coughs> 1, 6, and I mentioned this, in 5, 10, say you've made them kings and priests. And, uh, and Revelation 26, in the millennium, they will be priests of God and Christ, and they'll be kings. They'll reign with him for a thousand years. Um, I think that even if Revelation 20 in some way is talking about the future, that, that it's inaugurated here. Because this is the millennial reign. And so here's the king. I think this is the millennial kingdom, and this is the millennial reign here. So um, you notice this. They are reigning upon the earth. Right here, see that? Now some manuscripts have they will reign upon the earth. But it's just a hard, I think this is the best reading. Um, everybody see that? I mean, that, that's a good example of already and not yet millennialism. Or inaugurated millennialism. I think that's a simple one. It's not as hard as the others. Oh, we're not getting into Romans 11. <laughs> we could. That's why I have it there. But now, let's see. It's, uh, we have three minutes for, for post-millennialism. That's right. We have three minutes for post-millennialism. Now, before we leave this subject, uh, any questions about the, the uh, amillennial or inaugurated millennial view and Revelation, uh, the premillennial view? Any questions about that? Okay. 
see what we can do with post-millennialism. Now, uh, a few months ago, someone emailed me and said, I've just done an essay on post-millennialism. Uh, it's by an amillennialist, and he says, I, I've submitted this to a journal, and I'm hoping it'll be published. Would you read over it? So I did, and I really liked it. And I said, yeah, yeah, I made a few corrections here and there, a few revisions. And, and so I talked to him recently by email. I said, are you going to publish this? He said, yeah, it'll be published in Themelios, an online journal. And by the way, it's a free online journal sponsored by Gospel Coalition, Themelios. It means foundation in Greek, but it's spelled T-H-E-M-L-E-I-O-S. Themelios means foundation. I really encourage all of you to read those articles. They're very, very good articles. Very good. So, uh, this, I, I'm really, I really liked what he had to say, so I'm basically gonna, going to summarize uh, his forthcoming article, which is outstanding. Uh, it begins with him quoting the um, Second Helvetic Confession of 1566. This is a very early confession, like Heidelberg, um, uh, like uh, Westminster, very early. And here's what they say. We further condemn Jewish dreams that there will be a golden age on earth before the day of judgment, and that the pious, having subdued all their godless enemies, will possess all the kingdoms of the earth. So they, um, they condemn that view. Uh, very unusual to have that in an early Reformed confession. None of the others have it. It may be that with the Westminster, a lot of them were post-millennialists. Could be a reason that they don't have that there. So, but at any rate, on the European sector, it seems that post-millennialism had less sway. So in 1977... Uh, a book, The Meaning of the Millennium, Four Views. Uh, in that book, George Eldon Ladd, a well-known New Testament scholar, responded with extreme brevity to Lorraine Bettner's argument for post-millennialism. Lor Lorraine Bettner wrote a, a book published by Presbyterian Reform Press on post-millennialism. And uh, George Eldon Ladd was reviewing it, and uh, it was a half-a-page review. And he said... His opening comment was, there's so little appeal to Scripture, I have little to criticize. <laughs> now, a much shorter but far more momentous book on eschatology appeared in 1977 titled God's Plan for Victory, the Meaning of Postmillennialism by R.J. Rushdoony, founder of the Reconstruction, Christian Reconstruction Movement. Uh, it's not long. It's only 43 pages. But it's now in third edition. It's had some influence. So what are the post-millennial distinctives? Um, it basically uh, is alone in viewing depictions of the universal destruction of unbelievers. So it takes these passages, and we're going to look at some of them, passages in the Old and New Testament that see that this is judgment of unbelievers. The post-millennialist often and typically takes these as metaphors for the Christianization of all the nations rather than predictions of judgment. So they, they see these predictions of judgment and say, God's overturning their hearts and causing them to believe. That's the idea. God's destroying their unbelief and causing them to believe. That is, that, that's huge. That, that is one of their, that's the main scriptural passages that they go to, and we're going to look at some of them now. The burden, though, is to show from Scripture that the promised time of universal well-being and godliness, including the elimination of all Christ's enemies except death, must come to pass on earth before Christ's final coming. So there must be this final golden age, and they need to show that. Remember, that's hard to show in Revelation 20, where at the end, you, you, you don't have a golden age. You have a rotten dark age with the devil leading his hordes against the people of God. So, uh, what are the pillar proof texts? Matthew 28, 18 to 20. So let me read that again. Um, well, not again. I don't think I've read it yet. Well, I may have. Chapter 28. 
He says, verse 19, go therefore, you remember, uh, very famous, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, a nation whose uh, Christian percentage composes only 50% of the total population is not yet discipled according to the post-millennial view. Uh, the majority of every people group must be discipled as Christians before Christ returns. That's the idea, um, according to this interpretation of Matthew 28 in verse uh, 19 to 20. Now, I think it's important Again, to think, it says, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. Does that mean the majority of the nations? So that the majority of the nations will be discipled before Christ comes back. Um, it's a possible view. It, is, it, is it the probable view? Well, the same grammatical construction in Acts 8.40, where the direct object is all the cities, and the preceding verb is, he preached the gospel to all the cities. So you have the phrase in Acts 8.40, he preached the gospel to all the cities. Luke does not mean that Philip, who was doing the preaching, preached to uh, every city, say at civic meetings with virtually every citizen present. Luke doesn't even suggest that Philip preached to the majority of citizens in each city over the course of his stay. The phrase preached the gospel to all the cities does not imply a citywide comprehensiveness even for the majority of each city. I mean, when you think about it, it's almost pedantic to think about. It describes preaching the gospel to individuals in those cities. Likewise, in our passage, Matthew, to disciple all the nations does not imply that the majority of each nation would be discipled. It describes, I think, making disciples of individuals from or in those nations. So I think that you've got to be careful here. Um, now another point, all the nations does not imply worldwide comprehensiveness either. For example, in Matthew 24, 14, we're trying to, you know, <clears throat> use our concordance again. It says, this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed throughout the whole world as a testimony to all the nations. Now, it's interesting when post interpret that passage. Here's what they say. They believe that that took place already in the generation of the apostles in the sense that the gospel went uh, out to the nations and that that penetration was enough to say the gospel's been preached to the nations and it will continue to be preached. Um, in fact, in um, uh, yeah, let's see. Yeah, um, that they don't believe in that passage that um, uh, the gospel was proclaimed throughout the totality of every nation during the apostolic era. They ascribe neither nationwide nor, nor worldwide comprehensiveness to the prophecy in uh, Matthew 24, 14. So this is just an example where post millennials are a little inconsistent. Now, we're all inconsistent, okay? Uh, so, but here's a place where they see preaching the gospel to the whole world as a testimony to all the nations. For them, in that passage, it doesn't refer to all the nations. So there's an inconsistency. And thirdly, Paul declared in the first century, this is very interesting, not only had the gospel been, quote, proclaimed in all creation, but also that in all the world it is bearing fruit and increasing. Well, that's the time of Paul. We know that wasn't happening in China. We know that wasn't happening in Alaska. We know that wasn't happening in where New York City is, et cetera, et cetera. But basically, since the gospel had penetrated into the, the, the Gentile world, Paul can say, it's begun. The gospel to the world has begun. Um, <clears throat> Romans 10, 18 says that the gospel had gone out to all the earth, to the ends of the earth. Wow. 
Very interesting. Uh, so, Richard Gaffin concludes, the universal circumference of the gospel's triumph has been drawn by the ministry of the apostles so far as God has revealed his purposes. The subsequent process of filling in that circle could have been and can be terminated at any time. Now, still on, on chapter uh, 28, in verse 19, the Great Commission, together with the parables of the mustard seed and the leaven, engender confidence that the kingdom of God is continually growing and advancing to the end of the world. Postmillennialists take this in a very physical way, but it doesn't stipulate the degree to which the universal circumference of the gospel's triumph is. Um, and furthermore, it doesn't specify the nature of the kingdom. It doesn't say it's physical. It could well be spiritual. In fact, I think it is spiritual. That's why the Levin parable says it grows invisibly, uh, in my view. So, so uh, this passage is a pillar passage. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. I, I don't think that that affirms that the majority of the nations will be discipled and then Christ will come back and there will be a golden age. Um, any questions about that particular passage? Because that's a pillar passage, yeah. Good. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. That's not the way you would translate it, though. You don't say make disciple all the nations. Well, it doesn't make it any English, right? Well, you've got to make sense of it. You know, that's why Greek can't be a one-to-one -one language uh, in the English. Uh, if you've studied Greek, which you appear to have done so, you, you can't, like with a prepositional phrase and an infinitive, you can't, uh, you, you can't translate those directly. But even if you translate it that way, it still doesn't uh, nullify, for example, what um, Luke has said in um, chapter 8 and verse 40, where it says the direct object is tas poles pasas, all the cities. There it is. You can translate it. There you can translate it directly, and it follows the verb he preached the gospel to, tas, poles, Acts 8.40. Yeah, same construction. So, and there it's clearly not all the cities. So, um, I, I'd want you to explain that passage and why you explain it differently from the Matthean passage. But that's good. It's good to, uh, uh, I hope we have more post-millennialists. It'll make this a more healthy session. No, no more thoughts. I don't want to hear. Them. <laughs> okay, well, uh, jo I'm but, joking. But in uh, Matthew 24, uh, you're looking at, um, you know, and you're right, we interpret that to be talking about the kingdom of God and the kingdom of God. But then in the Matthew 24, it says, Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Yes. What's well, a witness to all the nations, though? Sure. Witness to all the nations. That's a further definition. You've got to let context be king, king and prime minister of what Oikomene is. But nevertheless, uh, I, I think that that's, I think that's inconsistent. You've got all the nations in Matthew uh, chapter 28. And here, it's not every nation. So... Um, well, let's keep going. Th thanks for that interaction. No, it's good. It's, it's, it's very good because often I don't have the um, 
uh, luxury of having real live uh, uh, positions that disagree with me and having the time to go back and forth, which I'm very grateful uh, to Trey for. Um, so I'm, I'm ready for more um, salvos uh, across my uh, face uh, as time goes. Um, so uh, the second pillar passage is 1 Corinthians 15, 24 to 26, the, suing, the subduing destruction of Christ's enemies. By the way, I will say it would have been really nice to have a, 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 a live and well premillennialist here in my earlier um, discussion of premillennialism because uh, that keeps the lecturer honest. So um, they're always, it's always different to present a view um, that you don't hold and to have someone there who holds the view and, and can respond back. So that's good. It's good. And, 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 I, and I'm very open for that. Let's see. We, we're at 3 o'clock. What if we go 15 more minutes and then, and then, and then take a break at 3.30? Or, or 3.15, okay. 1 Corinthians 15, 24 to 26. 1 Corinthians 15, 24 to 26. It's a second pillar passage. In 1 Corinthians 15, 24, it says, Then comes the end when he delivers up the kingdom to the God and Father, when he has abolished all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be abolished is death. Now, um, Paul is quoting um, in uh, verse 25 that he must reign until he's put all enemies under his feet. Uh, he's quoting Psalm 110. And um, some post-millennialists believe that verse 24, then comes the end when he delivers up the kingdom to the God and Father, when he has abolished all rule and authority and power, they take that as a conversion of the nations. That is, they are overcome by uh, the Spirit of Christ. He defeats their evil heart and they become regenerate. Uh, that, that's part of the idea. The Part of the problem with that interpretation is that, first of all, the context of the psalm, um, which is quoted, remember, um, in verse 25, he must reign until he's put all enemies under his feet. You'll notice that uh, as the psalm goes on in verse 5, it's not talking about defeating the enemy for conversion. Listen to what it's talking about, verse 5. He will shatter kings on the day of wrath. And uh, Paul uses that same language, day of wrath, to refer actual, to actual judgment, Romans 2, 5. Um, but before uh, returning to Paul's application of Psalm 110, notice the kind of destruction David has in mind. Again, he'll shatter kings. This is verses 5 and 6 of Psalm 110. He'll shatter kings on the day of his wrath. He will execute judgment among the nations, filling them with corpses. He'll shatter chiefs over the wide earth. You can't take this as a conversion of the nations. It's reversing the language, and I think too much. Uh, I think way, way too much. Um, and so likewise, um, Psalm 2, verses 8 through 9, listen to that. Quote, I will give you the nations as your inheritance and the ends of the earth as your possession, You'll break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. And this is taken as a prophecy of the conversion of the nations. Again, I think this is way too much of a reversal of the language. There's no warrant for it. Um, so, um, and furthermore, uh, in verse 24 of 1 Corinthians, when it says that he abolished all rule and authority, um, he says the same thing in verse 26. The last enemy that will be abolished. Same Greek word. Categorigo. Same Greek word. The last enemy that will be abolished. is That's definitely putting down an enemy. 
And so I don't think you can uh, understand in verse 24, when he's abolished all rule and authority of power, that that's a conversion of the nation. So furthermore, all authority, rule, and power refers to demonic, heavenly rulers, not earthly rulers, as is very clear in Ephesians chapter 1, where it says that at Christ's resurrection, uh, he was raised far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and every name that is named. And that those are evil uh, powers and authorities is very clear from that famous uh, text in Ephesians 6, which says, if you, you remember it's the spiritual armor passage, finally be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, powers, World forces of this darkness, spiritual forces of wickedness. So uh, it's not even talking about enemies on the earth at that point. It's talking about a heavenly evil enemies. So I, I think that the exegesis, the actual interpretation of these texts, is taken to mean the opposite. These are judgment texts. They're not judgment of the heart that results in conversion. That's the way they're taken. I think it's uh, uh, taking them too figuratively. Um, so we've already mentioned Revelation 20 and verses uh, 7 to 10 where this age ends darkly, not in a golden shining age. I think that's difficult. Um, and then uh, that final battle in Revelation 19, uh, if you have your Bibles, I'd like you to turn there, that final battle, Revelation 19. <clears throat> There are two commentators that are post-millennial. There's one by the name of, um, I believe his name is Douglas Wilson. The other is uh, David Chilton. And um, Wilson, well, we'll start. Let's read the text. Get it before our mind. Verses 11 through um, 21. 11 through 21. Now, <clears throat> I know some of you have your Bibles. And you might tell that my voice is beginning to wane. So I need somebody to read chapter 19, verses 11 to 21. I think there's a post-millennialist praying that my voice will wane. That's what I think. <laughs> Anybody want to volunteer to read that for us? Yes, sir. Could you read it and read it? stand up and read it loudly and face everybody, if you don't mind? Okay, here's the way David Chilton, in a commentary on Revelation, he's a post-millennialist and a, a reconstructionist, as I recall. Um, that means that he believes in such a transformation, positively, progressively, that it will affect culture, it will affect the law, and that the Mosaic law will be reinstated uh, into our governments, 
in some way, and that eventually that will lead until into this golden age. And so um, here's what he says, quote, St. John in this passage is not describing the second coming at the end of the world. He is describing the progress of the gospel throughout the world, the universal proclamation of the message of salvation, which follows the first advent of Christ. And I, I look at it and I say, well, where's that? Where's the message of salvation? Um, so let's keep going. Uh, first of all, in this passage, John borrows from Psalm 2 9. Notice uh, in uh, uh, verse 15, he will smite the nations, rule them with a rod of iron. That's from Psalm 2 9. He alludes to Isaiah uh, 63 1 to 6 and, and other passages, which are judgment passages. Uh, behind each of these descriptions, and I could go through them with you. Chilton posits that this predicts, quote, the message of the gospel, the word sword of the Spirit, would go, which goes out from Christ's mouth and destroys his enemies by converting them. So let's look at that. That would be a nice one to look at because that's Isaiah 11, 4. And, and so let's look at it, verse 15. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may smite the nations, and he'll rule them with a rod of iron. So that's a conversion of the nations. So let's do our concordance study. You remember that phrase? Coming out of the mouth. Um, it's a four or five word phrase in Greek. Do you remember? It always refers to judgment. It refers either to the sword coming out of Christ's mouth in chapter 1, which is the sword of judgment, and he makes that clear in uh, chapter 2. And... Um, to, to believe that the, the, the church of uh, Pergamum, where uh, he says, I'm coming to you quickly, and I'll make war against them with the sword of my mouth. And, um, and so likewise, this passage seems to be, uh, as its context in 11.4, Isaiah 11.4 uh, says this, this is the, where the illusion comes from, um, But with righteousness he will judge the poor and decide with fairness for the afflicted of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod or the sword of his mouth. And with the breath of the lips he will slay the wicked. So this is judgment language here. And so uh, Chilton says this is about the, the gospel word sword uh, uh, ministry of the spirit. It goes out from Christ's mouth and destroys his enemies by converting them. First of all, looking at the phrase coming out of the mouth, it's always judgment uh, about six times. And so I, I think it's likely the case here. I don't think you could transform this into a conversion passage. Um, so to say that the killing of the Antichrist followers by the sword proceeding from his mouth refers to conversion, I think is to reverse the meaning. And especially, I mean, you can see... Things aren't going too well in uh, verse uh, 17. Come assemble for the great supper of God in order that they may eat the flesh. I mean, this is a pretty horrible war here. This is not conversion. And um, I, th I think that uh, Chilton has overreached. Um, but that's an interesting word. I was reading a commentary on uh, recently, and it was uh, on, on Revelation. And it keeps repeating, Beal has overreached. Beal has overreached on how he understands the use of the Old Testament in this passage. So, uh, you know. Now, how does Wilson take this? This is very interesting. Do you know how Wilson takes it? Very intriguing. Wilson takes it as a judgment passage. So he's right. But. He takes it in a preterist way and applies it to Jerusalem. He says, this is about the destruction of Jerusalem. So again, I don't think that you can limit this to Jerusalem. Uh, I mean, it, it does say in verse 15, from his mouth comes a sharp sword so that with it he may smite the nations. And then, then we have verse 18 the flesh of kings, commanders, flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, those who sit on them, the flesh of all men, both free and slaves and small and great. The, the, these are about the kings of the earth, verse 19, and their armies assemble to make war.
So I, I, it's hard to make that Jerusalem. Uh, I think it's really, really hard. So on the one hand, he sees the judgment language, and he wants to do, give justice to that, but then I think he narrows the target down uh, way too much. Um, so Chilton, on the other hand, does recognize the worldwide scope, but he, he uh, spiritualizes it and makes it into conversion. So uh, here's my conclusion, and it's Romans 8. And again, I actually appreciate postmillennialism because I think it's right in one regard. It does talk, it is, I do think there's a spiritual advance from the time of Christ's resurrection to the end. And I agree. Except I think it's mainly spiritual. Whereas the postmillennialist includes culture and material in it. It becomes a kind of health and wealth advance. So that at least by, before Christ comes, 51% of the world has become dominated. Now some post-millennialists to explain how um, Revelation 20 ends uh, pessimistically say, well, uh, these are just Christians by name. Now, they're not real Christians. Well, that kind of hits at the heart of what true post-millennialism is, that there's really been the discipling of the nation. So that doesn't quite work. But Romans 8 says this, Verse 18, I consider the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but because of him who subjected it in hope. That the creation itself will be set free from its slavery to corruption into the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Now, is that at the time of a golden age? Uh, is, that, is that before Christ returns? Well, it goes on. For we know the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. And not only this, but we ourselves, having the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, waiting eagerly for our adoption of sons, the redemption of our body. And so this groaning will end when our body is redeemed. And so I, I see this, this, this period of the effects of the fall continuing until Christ returns. Um, so I, I don't see in this unresurrected world that people will, uh, uh, that the world will, will, will grow in a spiritual and physical way in terms of Christianization. Um, as in John 16, 33 says, in the world you have tribulations. And um, Acts 16, 14, 22 says, we enter the kingdom of God through many tribulations. Uh, Jesus tells Pilate, if my kingdom were this world, my servants would have been fighting. So, um, again, the, I, I think uh, it, it's an overstatement of many of these passages to take them as passages about uh, the progressive uh, um, progress of the world until a golden age. Now, uh, could, I, could I ask your name in the back? Will? Yeah, Will. Will. Um, th and I thank you for your earlier uh, question. It was really a good one and, and, and your point. But do you want to make any points here that you think are really, that you think are the, the best ones? Maybe I haven't covered. What, would you, uh, what, do, what do you want to go for? I mean, there's a, there's a couple passages in the Old Testament. Um, I mean, there's New Testament passages as well, but um, I would be curious about one specific passage and how you would handle it. Okay. Um, what is it? Psalm 22, 27 through 28. Okay. And how, just how it works with your framework of thought. Um, all the ends of the earth will turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will worship before thee. Um, well, and again, I think what we're remembering here is what's happened. It is the crucifixion uh, of Christ that is typified here, and it's moving to that. So that's the event here. For the kingdom is the Lord's, for he rules over all the nations. The prosperous of the earth will eat and worship. All those who go down to the dust will bow before him, even he who cannot keep his soul alive. Posterity will serve him, and we told of the Lord to the coming generation. 
They will come and declare his righteousness to a people who will be born that he is, uh, that he is performed. So is it mainly verse 27 that, that yeah, you have Yeah, I was mostly t talking about verse 27 and 28. So, like, so all the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations will worship before you. For the kingdom is the Lord's, and he rules over the nations. Yeah, and and what, just one point. I've I've heard some objections like, well, couldn't it just be like a singular family within the nations, like when you're comparing this to like the Great Commission? But it seems like the language of Scripture is pretty optimistic overall, like all the family, and I'm, I'm not a universalist, that would be heresy, but it does seem to be very optimistic in the nature of the growth of the kingdom where all the families of the earth, it doesn't seem like it's just, okay, there's just a few um, so that's, that's why I would ask that question. Well, I think, first of all, we would have to ask that, you know, is, is this referring to the very eschatological end um, at the final judgment when people recognize what's going on? And so uh, uh, everybody, you know, all the diversity from the ends of the earth and all the uh, families uh, of the nations will worship God at that point. I think it's similar, perhaps, to Revelation chapter 7, where John sees in verse 9, after these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which right. no one could count, from every nation, uh, and all tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, and palm branches were in their hands. So I think that um, basically... Uh, you, you have some from every nation. Um, so I, I, I would take all the families of the nations in the same way I do, uh, similarly at, at any rate, to, uh, to Matthew. Um, do you tell me how you take it? you take it as being every tribe or, or, or what? Well, yeah, I mean, when I look at the language of Scripture, you, um, even in Revelation 5, it's all nations, tribes, and tongues. And again, I'm not saying that it's every single individual without exception, but it seems like that sort of like repetitive, all nations, tribes, tongues, uh, Daniel 7, like all peoples, uh, I forget all the, off the top of my head, all peoples, languages, nations. So it's yeah, well, it's that language, like yeah, and you, you mentioned Revelation 5. And yeah. It says, and they sing a new song in verse 9, Worthy are you to take the book to break its seals, for you were slain, and did purchase for God with your blood, not every tribe, but men from every tribe and tongue and sure. people and nation. In fact, that's one a passage that's a support for what we call limited atonement. He did not shed his blood for all of them, but some from every tribe and tongue and people and nation, and then when he, um, he goes on, and uh, actually that phrase, every tribe and tongue and people and nation, mm -hmm. that is from Daniel 7. That's an allusion to Daniel 7, 14. Mm -hmm. And now it's used for limited atonement. Hmm. So, you know, a lot has to do with how does the New Testament also take these things? We have two testaments, and uh, we know... Um, from the New Testament, uh, that, uh, for example, as Revelation takes some of these universal terms and then uh, begins to see them as not universal with respect to every single person. So, um, so I would take uh, all the ends of the earth. Remember, that's in parallelism with all the families of the nations. Um, They'll come and worship before you. So I, I, I would take this as the diversity of the nations who, uh, you know, is, is all all without exception or all with distinction? That's the question sure. with the all. Yeah. It's always a question in all these passages. So, and so just a question for clarification, just so I understand your position better. Um, would you maybe say because, his, you know, history's been going and going, so it's just, it's cumulative uh, throughout history, all these different, like it's it's growing and growing and growing because time is passing on and on and on, but you would say it's ultimately just it's a remnant throughout time. Um, but I don't think we ever get add. away. I, the biblical theology of the remnant probably starts before Noah, but definitely with Noah, and I don't think it ever stops. Mm -hmm. You even get it in Romans 11. In fact, where in Rome we could, we could talk about Romans 11, but 
uh, in Romans 11, Paul begins very intriguingly with this statement uh, about Elijah, where he, he says, as God rejected his people in verse 1. In verse 2, God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Or do you not know what the scripture says in the passage about Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel? They have killed your prophets. They have torn down your altars. I alone am left. Wow, he, he had a real extreme view of the remnant. Uh, but what is the divine response to him? I have kept the majority of Israel, not just you. Thank you. Someone said no. No! He says, what is the divine response? I've kept 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. And then he says, in the same way then, consequently, there has also come to be at the present time a remnant according to God's gracious choice. And so... There, there's a remnant now. And then when he says in verse 26, and let, we can interact on this one. I, I imagine you have a view on it. Um, <laughs> and that is, and so all Israel will be saved. How do you take that all? Is it will? Yeah, so um, I would say that it is. Hey, yeah, is this good? Is this fun? Yeah. I mean, uh, this is good, okay. right? I don't want to take too this much like time. I know Trey this wants is, to ask questions. This is what too, a classroom yeah. ought to be, right? <laughs> I mean, I know we're kind of worshipful here, but we can kind of have classroom atmosphere. Yes, Will? Yeah, so um, before looking at 26, just hopping down to 28, it says, as regards the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. So I feel like you almost have to take Israel there as ethnic Israel because we can't, if we we're to say, obviously there is the theme that we are the true Israel. Right. Um, I'm agreeing with that. So yeah. a lot of what you've said in re that regard, sure. I agree with. Yeah. Um, you clearly see that we're the Israel of God sure. now. Yeah. But in, in this specific passage, it's difficult to say that this isn't talking about ethnic Israel because it says as regards uh, the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. So, And then when you go to 25, it says the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Um, or, well, let me read the very beginning. Lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial, a partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, and in this way all Israel will be saved. And so the way I take it, when you look at, and you're probably aware, I know you're aware of this, but ethnos could be nation, and so I think it's the fullness of the Gentiles, so all other nations are saved, and then Israel is the last of the nations to be saved um, at the end of time. Which ethnos are you talking about? What verse? Uh, verse 25, the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. Uh, yes, okay. Thank so you. the way yeah. I understand that is yep. it's all nations yep. before Israel. Israel's actually the last of the nations. And you yeah. see something similar to that in Isaiah 19 where it has, uh, I think it's Isaiah 19, 25, but it's like, how does it phrase it? It's like there's Assyria first and then Egypt and then Israel will be numbered third. So it's not like they're just this prominent first people. It's like... They're numbered third among these other nations. So yeah, well, I'm not sure I would take that as chronological sequence. We need well, to yeah, maybe not chronological that. sequence, but just among others. Yeah, yeah. it just yeah. says first, second. I mean, that's I just think what you're the text exactly says. right. By the way, that this is ethnic Israel. Okay, I think you're exactly right. So let me tell you how I understand the passage. Sounds good. Um, it was we're looking at chapter 11, and verse 26, and so all Israel will be saved. Now. Let me see. I don't know if I have this. Let's check it out. Let's see. No, I'm okay. Oh, you can't see it? What happened? You closed it. Oh, my goodness. Now, this is not post millennial, this is not progression. <laughs> this is an argument against it. This is the tribulation. Let's let's stick with <laughs> let's stick with the text, Doctor Beale. <laughs> what was that? I said let's stick with the text, Doctor Beale. <laughs> All right, you insist. Something's going on here. We got something different. <laughs> Beautiful. Oh, thank you. Good. Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah, I don't have the text, so I want everybody to open their Bibles. Look at verse 26. 
And so all Israel will be saved. Now, in Greek, and this is not going to be hard for those of you that don't know Greek. In Greek, it says uh, kaihutos pas Israel sophesitai. And so all Israel will be saved. Kaihutos pas Israel sophesitai. So it's and... That's a good translation. Some translations have then, though. They see this passage as after verse 25. Say, and then all Israel will be saved. I don't think we can do that. It's and. But the next word is crucial. It's and, and it's not, it's not um, thus. How many have thus in their Bible? And thus all Israel will be saved. Anybody have thus? What do you have? Yeah. Wow, what translation is that? The ESV, they've done it right this time. Yes, in this way or in this manner, all Israel will be saved. Well, that raises a question, doesn't it? In what manner will all Israel be saved? This is not a time references. And then, this is, you can't uh, explain thus, as th some people say, and thus, and then. No. There's some who translate it that way. It's never temporal in Paul. Now, maybe one time in Acts it is. Maybe in Josephus, who's a Hellenistic uh, um, writer, uses it temporally. But not Paul. Paul always uses it to refer in this manner. In fact, even in this chapter, just to show you, uh, if you notice, uh, chapter 11, verse 5, uh, in the same manner then, there's come to be a remnant. So in the same manner as there was a remnant at the time of uh, um, Elijah, so there is now. And um, so and he keeps using it that way, and I think that's the way he's using it here. So we have got to ask ourselves. It's not, and then all Israel will be saved. This is not coming after verse 25. It's, and in this manner all Israel will be saved. What manner? Well, we do have to go to verse 25 to see what manner. So let's read verse 25. For I do not want you, brethren, to be uninformed of this mystery, lest you be wise in your own estimation, that a partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Now that partial hardening, you have to understand, is the majority are hardened, okay? It's not partial in terms of small fraction. It's a part, it's a majority of the part. The majority of Israel. So... Uh, a majority hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this manner, all Israel will be saved. Well, in what manner will all Israel be saved? In a remnant-saving manner. In other words, the majority aren't going to be saved. So if we look at this, yeah. So, uh, here is one view. This is the futurist view. Uh, and there are some Reformed people. Even John Murray held this view. So there are some that, that hold this view. And Murray was an amillennialist, by the way. Um, so the, the view I disagree with is this one, that the full number of the Gentiles is being saved during the church age, and then all Israel, the majority of Israel, are saved. I don't think that's what this passage is saying, even though I have close friends who do. Douglas Moo uh, uh, thinks so. We had a debate about it before students. We had a good time, had dinner beforehand, and joked, and then got mad at each other. <laughs> <laughs> then, here, here's the church age. The full number of the Gentiles is being saved. And what's happening during that time? The majority of Israel is hardened. But what does that mean? The remnants being saved so that in this manner all Israel will be saved. In what manner will all Israel be saved? They'll be saved in a non-majority way. Here it's the majority who are hardened. Here it's the remnant. And in this manner, in a remnant saving manner, happening at the same time the Gentiles are coming in at that time, ethnic is this is ethnic Israel, this is a remnant of ethnic Israel. Now I think there are other passages, well you have said, where the church is seeing Jew and Gentile is true Israel. This is not one of them. Right. I think this is a remnant of ethnic Israel. So I do agree with you, and I think it's happening at the same time 
as here, so there's not some final influx of physical national Israelites at the end of the age. That's happening throughout the age, and that's really what Paul's concerned about because he has said, notice he says in uh, verse 13, I'm speaking to you who are Gentiles, and as much then as I'm an apostle of Gentiles, I magnify my ministry. Notice, if somehow I might move to jealousy my fellow countrymen and save all of them. Thank you. Some. It's a remnant. He realizes it's going to be a remnant because the majority have been hardened. So that's his ministry to save a remnant throughout the church age. Who knows? Christ could have come back in his time because he comes like a thief unexpectedly. We don't know. We should be expecting Christ uh, e even right now. I pray he will come and tell us what the truth on this matter is. <laughs> so... Um, if he does come now, then he'll prove that I'm wrong, so there's that. <laughs> come, Lord Jesus! <laughs> See if I have anything else to say. Um, yeah, it's interesting to look at the uh, allusions and quotations in Romans 9 through 11. Uh, the majority of them, if you see the asterisks, those are restoration prophecies. The majority of them are about the restoration of Israel. The, Romans 9 through 11 is about the restoration of Israel. And it's beginning in an already and a not yet way. For example, have you ever thought about this in Romans 10? When uh, Paul says in verse 12, that, that God is Lord over all. And then he says, verse 13, for whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. That's from Joel, right. chapter 2. In verse 32, it's about Israel. Now it's clearly about Jew and Gentile. So here's a case where a prophecy about Israel is fulfilled in Jew and Gentile. But in this case, uh, in our case, I think this is talking only about ethnic Israel that's being saved throughout the church age, but it's only a remnant of them. So um, so that's, uh, any questions about Romans? Any, that's, a, that's a very tough one. In fact, I'm embarrassed to try to summarize it so quickly. Um, but I, yes? Well, yes. What do I think about Ken Gentry's view about Revelation being a divorce document and what else? Yeah. Well, I just don't see that, to, to be quite honest, I don't see that exegetically in the book of Revelation, uh, a, an actual divorce document. Uh, references to it in the Old Testament. Um, we, we have, I actually have in a face-to-face -face way interacted with uh, um, uh, Gentry at a, at a small conference of scholars uh, that, that R.C. Sproul pulled together a number of years ago. And um, so I, I, I can uh, tell you a few of the places where I radically disagreed with his programmatic approach. Uh, one of them is in chapter 1 where it says in verse Seven, behold, he's coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. Well, that phrase, every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him, that is from Zechariah 12.10. He takes that as judgment. This is judgment, and that's the tone of the whole book. Well, I mean, I think he's right. There is judgment in the book. But this phrase is not talking about judgment. In the context of Zechariah, uh, listen to what it says after chapter uh, 12 and verse 10. Um, I'll pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplication, so they will look on me whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. They'll weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn. This is the... This is the um, the mourning of repentance, I'll pour out a spirit of grace and of supplication. So he is rending the context of the Old Testament. 
This is not about judgment. Uh, intriguingly, I've been talking about post-millennialists that turn judgment text into conversion text. Here's a case where he, probably as a post-millennialist, turns a conversion text into a judgment text. It's kind of interesting. But that, that, that's one example where I would disagree with him uh, exegetically. He's a very kind person. We had a very amicable uh, in, in interaction. At that time, I'd just finished my commentary in Revelation, and I think he was doing his book as, as, as well. So I, I, that's not an in-depth uh, reply to what you're saying, but um, if you wanted to bring up a particular text that you know demonst you think demonstrates his view, I'm happy to hear that, and then I could interact with it. But generally, I just don't see Scripture <laughs> affirming that broad idea of revelation as a divorce text. Um, I, I do think that uh, see, the problem is, um, as you've seen, um, to say that now Israel's rejected and it's being given over to the church, on, on one level that is true, the church has its problems. As I've already argued, we are in this covenantal relationship, in a sense, modeled on Israel's covenant, and we have become like Israel of old. Uh, the majority of the church has become hardened, anesthetized, and, uh, and, and so um, not all is well on planet Earth with the church. And so um, I, I would have to, you know, as, as we went through various texts, we would disagree in this way. I think it's huge. You have got to let the meaning of the Old Testament text always carry over into the new. Now, there may be small uh, exceptions to that. Let me give you an example, small exception. In Galatians... Uh, in, in chapter 3, you'll all remember it, it says, um, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. And speaking about Jesus there. But it's a quotation of Deuteronomy 21 23. This was the most heinous thing that uh, uh, would, a criminal would undergo to be executed and hung on a tree. Is Jesus a criminal? Thank the Lord. I would say this is not a twisting of the Old Testament, this is an ironic use of the Old Testament. Jesus took the criminal's punishment for us so we would not have to take it. Thank the Lord for that ironic use of Deuteronomy uh, 21. But that would be an example. Um, I had a doctoral student who did a um, dissertation on um, statements in the book of Revelation that looked like they were opposite in meaning to their Old Testament context. And... Um, some of them he saw as ironic. Others he saw as, um, well, they're not as opposite as we think. So uh, w one person uh, is a scholar. He's made fun of my view because he disagrees with me that the Old Testament context always inform us positively about what is going on when that context is quoted in the New. And he thinks the New Testament writers preach the right doctrine but not from uh, the right text. They preach the right doctrine from the wrong text. Uh, sometimes like, Preachers. I don't know if you've ever heard a preacher, and he, you open the Bible, he gives the scripture reading, concludes with, thus endeth the reading of God's word, and no truer words were spoken about the rest of, of his passage, because uh, his message, he, you wonder, where is this guy? He's certainly not talking about the passage he read. And so um, uh, this, this fellow, this particular scholar, thinks that uh, New Testament writers will do that, and um, quote texts but use them in totally opposite to what their meaning was in the Old Testament for their own purposes, but they were inspired. It's very interesting. And so um, th this particular scholar quotes me, and he says, you know, Beale, uh, he thinks if you just do enough hard work in those Old Testament passages that you'll ultimately find a solution for why they're used in the way they are. And he thought that was kind of a funny criticism. I said, yes, it's exactly my view. So I... I, I I don't know. Um, he thought that was some kind of weakness in my view. I, I don't see it. So I think, uh, are we supposed to, are we going to come back? Take 10 minutes. Come back, yeah. 10 minute quick break. We've got any questions. Okay, 10 minutes. Have some